Welcome to this special edition of the GH Files on Sahara TV. My name is Kwesi Isan Bakun. With me in the studio today is a very special guest. He is an economist and a banker, one time deputy governor of the Bank of Ghana, and thrice nominated vice presidential candidate for Ghana's biggest opposition party. He wields, among other several accolades and qualifications, a master's degree in economics at the Lincoln University, Oxford and a PhD also in economics from the Simon Fraser University, Vancouver, Canada. As one of the country's leading economists, he has contributed to national discourse, especially in his field of excellence, and recently presented a critique of the country's new IMF bailout deal. While the government of Ghana hails the deal as a victory, our guest looks at it from a different perspective. Welcome to the studios of Sahara TV, Dr. Mohamedou Baumia, Vice Presidential Candidate for Ghana's New Patriotic Party. My singular honor to have you in the studio today, sir. Thank you very much. The honor is mine. Thank you so much. So first of all, can you walk us through what the IMF deal entails? You are not very enthused about it. Can you just? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say. I'm not enthused about the fact that we had to get here mm. to get to a bailout situation. But I think the deal itself, it's a deal that tries to sanitize the finances of the country because um, you got to a situation where the center could not hold mm -hmm. and things were falling apart and the government had borrowed itself into a situation where it was no longer really being able to pay its bills and the balance of payments were in real jeopardy. And so they needed a bailout. And the bailout essentially entails uh, fiscal consolidation uh, so that the debt of Ghana can be more sustainable. Uh, and in that regard, you're going to go through the normal, you know, tighten your belt, you know, mm. cut expenditure, increase taxes. Uh, they also want to reduce subsidies, um, which, which, which basically tries to get the fiscal in, 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 in place. The, the bailout also entails um, cutting down your borrowing. The government is borrowing a lot as far as the IMF is concerned, and government needs to cut down its borrowing. Uh, the central bank is also coming in for some reform. Uh, the lending to government by the central bank is also going to be curtailed quite drastically. Uh, the exchange rate side in terms of the reforms of the foreign exchange market, such that the central bank is not going to be in a position to manipulate the exchange rate as we saw in 2014 mm -hmm. with this disconnect between the Bank of Ghana rate and the market rate. Uh, there are reforms uh, which will you know, entail uh, some of that. Uh, and also in the foreign exchange market, there are reforms that will mean that gold exporters, for example, do no, no longer would have to hand over their foreign exchange to the Bank of Ghana. Uh, but all in all, the whole idea is to bring back discipline, restore macroeconomic stability. I think that is the goal of the IMF mm, deal. Okay. Yes. So you've, you've presented this critique called um will the anchor hold, which is currently um, a document, a, well, a much sought after document, as I would say. Um, in it, you, you mentioned that the, the NDC government at present collected 15.2 billion Ghana cities in eight years, as opposed to, no, sorry, 62 billion, as opposed to 15 billion by the NPP when it was in power. Yeah. Um, the taxation, however, they, they, they don't, the, basically, the critique is against the NDC collecting all this money and misusing it. What would you rather give them um, credit, though, for widening the tax net? For instance, looking at sixty-two billion and fifty-two, fifteen <laughs> mil billion. Right. You see, I think I think um, the the context in my lecture was that this government has had more revenue yeah. or, and more resources than any other government in our history, probably all other governments put together. And this is in the area of tax revenue, as you've just mentioned, four times the tax revenue that we had when our, our party was in government. Then you look at loans. Uh, they've taken since they've added 
at the end of 2008, when we left office, the loan book was 9.5 billion. They added 66 billion to it, and now stands at 76 billion. Then you have Coco. We took in revenue of 7.4. They've had, uh, I mean, exports of 7.4. They've had exports of 15. And then gold exports of 9 billion. They've had 25 billion. And then you you. Look at oil. We never had oil. Yeah. They've had exports of 13 billion, revenue of about 3 billion. So I was putting all of this together to say this is a government that has had huge resources, yeah. but at the end of the day, it cannot pay its bills. It's behind on district assembly common fund, it's about behind on the GET fund, it's behind on school feeding, it's, it's behind to, on payments to contractors, national health insurance. These were all programs that were working. When when the MPP was in power with very little in the way of tax resources. Mm -hmm. And now you've come with all of these resources, four years after the production of oil, and then you are going to for a bailout. And so we are saying there is mismanagement. Now, obviously, increasing taxes, as, as you say, um, is something that you will see with, 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 with governments as the economy grows and so on. Mm -hmm. But what you are seeing from the increase in taxes that we are, we are seeing. It's more an increase from an increase in the tax rates rather than more in terms of widening mm. the tax net. Mm. So you saw this 2.5 percent addition to the v, VAT, VAT, for example. You've seen, you know, stamp d d taxes on trotro drivers, taxi drivers, and the informal sector as a whole. You go to the ports, special import levies. I mean, importers are crying. Uh, and it's there. The national fiscal stabilization levy is there. Um, taxes on condoms, <laughs> on mm -hmm. cutlasses. You know, because of the desperation for tax revenue, you know, they, they actually implemented taxes on, t on cutlasses, the agricultural inputs, uh, and condoms. Uh, and, 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 and so you, you, you see that you've got this tax revenue. The issue is not that you've got tax revenue. You've got tax revenue, you've got loans, you've got you know, oil revenue, you've got gold revenue, all of that. And we're saying that after all of that, considered, you should not be in a situation where you have to go for, for an IMF, for IMF bailout. bailout. Okay, that's that's one statement. You also yeah. you also mentioned that the MPP will focus on production and not taxation. Yeah. So I'm, I'm tempted to um, pro the, the taxation <laughs> question a bit further. Right, right. Is the MPP opposed to taxation? Oh, no, not at all. I, I think that no government can work without tax revenue. Taxes, uh, everybody works hard, pays their fair share of taxes, and government uses the tax revenue for development. Mm. What we are saying is that taxes can also become a burden on the private sector and on individuals. And you have to measure it to make sure that your taxes don't actually, you know, go against production in the economy. Mm -hmm. So I was talking, for example, to a businessman in New York, and I said, I mean, he makes fufu powder. Fufu is a, a Ghanaian mm -hmm. traditional yeah. dish, you know, mm -hmm. that we all enjoy. And, and I, I said, oh, that's great. And I has actually assumed that he was exporting this from Ghana here. But in fact, he's actually making it here mm. and exporting to Ghana. And I said, why is it? You know, he says, well, the cost of my inputs. If I take a contain, bring in a container of inputs into Ghana, I'm charged 13,000 Ghana CDs, or the equivalent at that time of about $4,000. He said, if I bring in the same container into the United States, I get $200 pay $200. So you are looking at almost 20 times mm. the import duty. So he finds it more convenient to set up here, produce here, and, and do that. If our you know, tax structure was properly uh, designed, mm. then we should rather be having people produce there, uh, employ people. And then when they employ people, we can get taxes from income taxes, we can get taxes from corporation taxes. When, so I am asking essentially for a paradigm shift. I want that, that we, we want to be a globally competitive economy. Mm -hmm. And so we want to look at the inputs into the production process, 
when businesses bring in these inputs to produce, you want to give them tax breaks. In fact, you really do not want to charge duties on those on those particular uh, inputs into production. Mm -hmm. When they produce, then you will have the basis to tax the profits or the incomes from the employees and so on. So let's give businesses incentives to produce. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to see this, and the MPP wants to see a paradigm shift. Uh, and 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 we we don't worry as much because if you look at our record between 203 and, and marginal tax rates and 208 marginal tax rates actually went down from 32.5 percent to 25 percent and tax revenue went up you know so once you increase production in the economy you will get tax revenue but mm. if you take the approach that you can only balance your books by increasing taxes you'll end up hurting production and usually the easiest way for governments across Africa is to go and stand at the ports mm. and tax everything that comes in. Comes but in. it ends up hurting production. Mm. And you are really in competition with other countries. If your cost of production is high, you cannot compete. Mm. And other countries are offering much lower taxes. Uh, and we think that is the way to go. Okay. So in the banking sector also, you've mentioned that you want to um, reduce the taxes on fin financial services, yes. for instance. Yes. Who would this benefit, though, and well, how, I, I, how so? Well, I think that it'll benefit the entire country. You know, the financial sector, Kwesi, is one of the areas where the country is lagging behind. About 80 percent of our population does not have a bank account, mm. the bankable pu pu public. 80 percent does not have a bank account. So financial services really need to be deepened. And the process of deepening will not be helped by taxes on the use of financial services. And, and they've done the same thing in, in imposing real estate on, re, on real, uh, VAT on real estate services. Again, the mortgage market is very weak. So for me, uh, if you want financial inclusion, which is what we should be aiming at. You want to encourage everybody to have a bank account, you know, and, and that you cannot do by imposing taxes on financial services. I think it is one of those areas where you need to encourage people to come in. But once they start thinking that when they bring in and they want a service, you're going to tax them, uh, it's, a, it's discouraging. Mm. It's discouraging. And I think it's not, there are not a lot of countries that have VAT on financial services. There are some, but there are not a lot. But in our situation, I don't think we should be in that direction. And I believe it should be abolished, and I believe it will be abolished under an MPP government. And you believe that that would have a trickle-down effect on the average man's pocket? It will, because if you do it in the context of actually putting in place a program for financial inclusion, then you will get the benefits. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that you know, this issue of financial inclusion is so critical to our development. If you look at all the countries that have modernized and advanced, they have done so. You go back to England or the Europe, you know, 1700, 1792, the Friendly Societies Act, and so on. If there's so many people were encouraged to come into the banking system. And with, when people come into the banking system, savings increase. Mm -hmm. And when savings increase, interest rates come down. The reason why interest rates are stubbornly high in many developing countries is because the amount of savings in the financial system is low. A lot of savings are outside the financial system. So it's a supply and demand issue. Once the savings are low, the price will be high, the interest rate will be high. Mm -hmm. So we need to bring in more savings into the financial system. And so, in fact, we have a program that we intend to, to, to put together within the first year or two uh, to make sure you have a, a huge increase in savings within the financial system by making sure people have bank accounts. And we have the technology already in place to help us do that even in the rural areas. Okay. I'm yeah. sure you're referring to East Ridge. Exactly. And we'll come to that in a That's second. Right. But That's before right. that, though, all the money that has been collected by this government with nothing to show for it, um, what do you attribute that to? Well, it is one of those um, issues that, that I think you, you, you need to, to look at. and you, Because when you say you've collected these monies and what have you used them for? 
first of all, usually the gov a government will say we've done projects with this money. Look at the infrastructure. But when you look at the infrastructure, you will see that a lot of this money has been collected, but the capital expenditure to GDP has actually been declining. We've got a decline from 9.1% in 2008 to 4.8% today. Mm. And so you cannot grow an economy when you are not investing. And we've increased the debt by so much, but investment in infrastructure relative to our GDP is on the decline. It has halved. And so there is a problem. But when you look at the budget items, there's one item that is stubbornly high, and that is consuming a lot of this money, and that is interest. Because see, at the end of 2008, Ghana's total debt was 9.5 billion Ghana CDs at that time, right? Mm -hmm. Today, it is 76.1 billion. Now, today, the interest on the debt is 9.57 billion Ghana CDs. <laughs> Just the interest on the debt, mm -hmm. which was exactly, is it's exactly equal to the total, the total debt amount of in 2008. Mm -hmm. Now, and this interest in the debt is 10 times the allocation that has gone to about eight key ministries, transport, health, education, trade, you name it. Eight key ministries, roads and highways, water. You add all of the allocation in 2015 in the budget, excluding the, the internally generated funds and what the donors will give. Eight key ministries, and their allocation is 952 million. The interest on the debt is 9.57 billion. That is 10 times. And one other thing, the interest on the debt alone is six times Ghana's oil revenue this year. Six times. So the borrowing has totally compromised our oil discovery. We were so excited that we had discovered oil and it is going to make a difference. But the government has gone out with this idea that we've discovered oil and has gone and borrowed to the hilt. And that is why you, 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 you now have interest, which is six times. We need six times our oil revenue to just pay interest, not, <laughs> not, not, not the capital talent there. There's the interest. So they've basically compromised the future of Ghanaians with this it's reckless borrowing. And this is why you are ending up at the IMF. And they are telling you that one of the aims, or the major aim of this IMF program, is to bring Ghana back to debt sustainability. Because we are now in the situation where we were during HIPIC, where you are having so much interest to pay on your debt, you don't have enough to pay on other things. And this is why you are behind on the health side, on the education side, on the school feeding side, local authority side, contractors. You, you don't have the cash mm. to meet your obligations. That's and that is the scary part for us. That's, you know? a, that's a very grim picture, Doc. Um, <laughs> it is grim. How about government pilfering? In your, in your critique, you also mentioned corruption, government yeah. pilfering. Yes. Yes, I, I think that corruption is, is unfortunately one of the uh, legacies this government is going to leave behind. And it's not just corruption. It is corruption with impunity because they are going about it in a manner that suggests that they don't really fear that they will be held accountable for what they have done. And I am saying that if you look at the, I mean, even President Rawlings had a, who <laughs> overthrew a government in 79, basically mm -hmm. talking about corruption, is saying that the, the corruption for which he overthrew that government in 79 is not up to 10 percent of the corruption <laughs> that he's seen with this government today. And when you look at the scandals and the size of the monies involved in these corruption scandals, it's mind-boggling. The GDA scandal, which has to do with the youth employment and entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. was 952 million Ghana CDs. The judgment debts, you hear about people sitting down and making up claims or, on government. Um, the judgment debt scandals was about 687 million Ghana CDs. SADA, the Savannah Accelerated Development, involves about 200 million that was allocated. 
mm. to it. Then you have the national service, estimated about 95 billion. The goes just those ones I've just mentioned now sum up close to 2 billion Ghana cities. Now, that 2 billion at the exchange rate at the time these candles broke is summing up to about $750 million of pilfering. $750 million. Now you've gone to the IMF to ask, and they have given you a program over three years for $918 million. Now, we've not even added the ghost names. We've not added the over-invoicing on contracts uh, that, 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 that you, you, you see. Um, and all of that. So, yes, <laughs> if you had these resources, as I said, the GIDA alone is equivalent to the eight ministries that I was talking about, their allocation in 2015. So, yes, the corruption, you know, takes away valuable resources from the budget that would have otherwise helped to pay District Assembly Common Fund, Get Fund, and all of that. They are not being paid mm -hmm. because the money is going elsewhere into some people's pockets. And this is why. Uh, uh, we, are, we are saying that it is a contributory factor, and this is why I made that point. It is a contributory factor to why we are at, we are at, at IMF. The doorstep of IMF. Looking for a so, bailout. So you also mentioned um, the resources from petroleum. Yeah. Uh, the government's reaction is that it's nothing to write home about. It's just a, a very meager portion of the income <laughs> of Ghana. It's nothing <laughs> that Ghana should be overly excited about. Well, how I, much? Uh, how much? impact I, will the oil I'm, revenue have I, on the I, economy? I, I, I disagree totally, and I'm actually shocked uh, that, that a government will say that petroleum is not that big a deal. It is a big deal. Oil exports have now overtaken cocoa. As, oil is now our second largest export commodity. And in fact, oil will become number one by 2017, if not 2016. Oil will become number one. So we have earned, we've exported 13.7 billion so far. We've exported about uh, over 100 million barrels of oil, and we've earned about three billion dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, three billion dollars is not chicken feed. It's not. <laughs> it's huge, <laughs> you know. Starting from a position of zero, I mean, the government went to the capital markets in 2013 and raised $1 billion, you know, and it was a big deal. They went back in 2014 and raised another billion dollars, and it is a very big deal, and they want to do all these projects, and they are even wanting to go in 2015 for another billion. Now, those three would be three billion. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's huge. You, hmm. Three billion can transform lives. You know, when you look at, you know, hospitals, you look at education, water, it can transform lives, agriculture. We could have built a railway from, you know, Accra all the way to Paga for that amount. So we, we can do transformational things, you know, but I suppose when you are used to big money, uh, you don't appreciate the value of money. You would mm -hmm. think $3 billion is not quite a bit. But for, for, for anybody who understands value for money, Three billion is a big deal for mm -hmm. Ghana. It's a really big, big deal. Okay, big so deal. still on the oil, on the petroleum yeah. sector, um, g government implemented um, what we call the Petroleum Resources Management Act in 2011, yeah. uh, 2011. That's right. And this is based on best practices of you know, yeah. several oil producing countries, yeah. and it's aimed at checking sanity in, in, right. you know, in the finance in the finances yeah. of that sector. Yeah. This, I would presume, gives the NPP and anybody else who is interested, some power to check that the money is coming in from this avenue is not, you know, mishandled. That's right. How is the MPP using this leverage or any it, other to it, check? Well, the, the, the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, I think, was done, was put together uh, after a lot of consultation. And the whole idea uh, after 2007, when oil was discovered, was to make sure that we did not fall into the situation that other oil producing countries had fallen into mm -hmm. and and the oil had essentially become a, a curse you know mm -hmm. to, on those countries so the you know petroleum revenue management act was put together as you said with with a lot of best practice in it unfortunately you know what we see in on paper and what is actually being practiced in ghana there's a little bit of a gap
we hopefully will, will, will bridge those gaps. But in the area of oversight and monitoring in particular, Section 51 of the Act, of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, um, gives that to the Public Interest Accountability Committee, the PIAC. Now, they are supposed to publish two reports a year on the utilization of the revenues. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's made up of, of citizens and, 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 and it, you know, basically public interest people who are supposed to do this. And they are supposed to be funded under the Act by the government. Unfortunately, the government has essentially reneged on its responsibility to provide funds to the Public Interest Accountability Committee. One would have thought that it would have been very, you know, forthcoming, but the government has not. In fact, in February, the Public Interest Accountability Committee complained that they, they've had only a thousand Ghana CDs left in their bank account, which is essentially about three hundred dollars. I mean, you are going to monitor a billion dollar industry <laughs> with two three hundred dollars I mean you, you are not going to get very far mm. and 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 they accuse the government of essentially sabotaging them I hope that is not the case and I, because it's very much in our interest as a country to to have the public interest accountability committee do its work so that we can see but obviously we also have avenues of Parliament and so on to to, to keep an eye on, on what is happening in the oil industry okay yeah. Now, the NDC says it's borrowing smart. This is a term which <laughs> they, they've, they've used quite often, borrowing smart. Is there ever a thing like borrowing smart? Oh, sure. I think you can borrow smart as you refinance more expensive debt, for example, or you borrow to invest. And then you, out of that investment, you repay and you have, you know, some, you know, positive returns from that borrowing. And I think that would be smart borrowing. But the sort of borrowing that we have seen under this government cannot be described as smart borrowing. The increase in the debt stock is incredible. But as I said, not only that, the burden, the interest burden is very high, and it has crowded out the private sector. Treasury bill rates are now at around 25 percent, lending rates over 30 percent. Uh, this Nobody can really do serious business in, in, in that environment. Uh, and then capital expenditure, as I have said, has been declining relative to GDP, even though you are borrowing so much. And growth in the economy has come down from 15 percent in 2011, when, when this our Revenue Act was passed, to 3.5 percent this year, 15 percent to 3.5 percent. You have a major increase in unemployment as a result. So there is a, 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 a difficulty for me to say that the borrowing that they have done is smart. It's not smart. It's reckless. <laughs> Reckless borrowing. Yes, yes. So you, you you also say that they borrow to, for instance, show up the foreign reserve yeah. instead of, like you've just stated, borrowing to invest, invest yeah. and you know having returns coming out of that. Mm. Is there any form of benefit at all to be to be accrued from borrowing to show up reserves? Well, I think it's it's a, a difficulty for me. I mean, first of all, when we pointed this out. I pointed this out when they borrowed a billion dollars last year from the euro bond market, a mm. billion dollars. And they went to the market to tell investors, we want to use this money to invest in projects, so we want to borrow. So people gave them that money for the purpose of investing in projects. Now, at that time that they borrowed this money, Ghana's foreign reserves were almost wiped out. The net international reserves could only cover two, two weeks of imports mm. at that time. This was in September uh, last year. So they used the money to shore up the reserves uh, in that sense. But they didn't come clean. When we pointed it out, they denied it. Now, if you think that it's a good idea, <laughs> you would not deny it. You will come clean and say, yes, this is what I'm using it for. But it's a wrong use 
of resource. You borrow money to shore up your exchange rate. How long can it last? I gave an example that if you meet a girl and you want to impress her and go and borrow your friend's car uh, to impress her, sooner or later, your friend will come back for his car and the girl will realize you really don't have a car. <laughs> so it's not a sustainable strategy. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I mean, borrowing those reserves to shore up the currency wasn't going to be sustainable. Has that kind of thing so ever worked at it, all it in any situation? Work. It cannot work because the, whatever stability you achieve will be temporary. Mm -hmm. And you've seen what has happened in the context of the exchange rate in Ghana. We achieved some stability, but today the exchange rate is moving again. Hmm. It's moving again, and, and, and this quarter alone, I mean, the first quarter of, 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 of 2015 alone, we have depreciated, uh, getting close to 15%.